good evening everybody uh, uh, this is actually the uh, month of uh, our monthly meeting of month of october in fact uh, last uh, week uh, with uh, bad weather condition we postponed it to uh, today uh, to recap our uh, past activities in uh, last two months uh, we had our uh, virtual get together on 9th october uh, we uh, and about uh, 25 to 30 uh, members were participated and most of ours is the uh, first experience in that kind and uh, uh, people enjoy it and uh, had uh, uh, had a good time with each other because we didn't have opportunity to meet each other in a long time so and uh, for future events uh, we have planned an excursion on uh, 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 on street photography in uh, Colombo Peta area. So we'll notify it you uh, later. And it's come to uh, today event. Uh, today we have very uh, special, very unique uh, uh, guest speaker, uh, David Blecker. Uh, actually, I, I want to say that he, uh, he accept my invitation without any hesitation and uh, give his fullest cooperation uh, because we didn't meet each other and we didn't know anything about each other at the time I first speak with him. So anyway, he uh, he he accepted our invitation and uh, uh, agreed to do a presentation. Uh, David is uh, is from uh, advertising field and uh, he's a uh, Photographer as well as a uh, very good writer. I had the uh, opportunity to go through his, some of his uh, documents, and uh, so he's an excellent writer. He has uh, experience in, uh, he has uh, worked with a uh, number of uh, international magazines, so his uh, work will speak about that. So, without much further uh, uh, introduction i invite david to uh, uh, do his uh, start his presentation this presentation is about uh, last uh, around one hour and he has two parts uh, two separate uh, projects he'll present uh, you if you have any questions you have you can uh, uh, use the chat box as well as uh, at the uh, uh, end of each session, you have opportunity to ask questions. Also, that is also uh, the David is not uh, bother if you disturb uh, time to time. Uh, he he is agree to take any questions, uh, especially uh, one or two questions during the session also. So. Uh, Again, I'll warmly welcome David to the PSSL Street and Travel Group, and uh, it's over to you, David. Thank you. Thanks, Nilan. Um, thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to speak to you guys. Um, I'm quite honored to be here and to present some of my work to you. Um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, two assignments uh, that I've worked on um, in the last couple of years, one, one is from a couple of years ago, the other one is from a few uh, years before. Um, basically, I'm just going to take you through how it works, um, how I'm briefed on it, and uh, what I did with it. Um, I'm going to show you a lot of photos, so um, I, I won't talk too much. Um, I won't go into too much detail about uh, describing the photos and the, uh, the concepts behind it because it's, it's very journalistic type photographs. So there's not a lot of editing. There is a not, not a, sometimes the compositions aren't um, that carefully done because, uh, because of the nature of the way it's taken. Um, so anyway, um, let me start off by talking about this. So the, the first one, as you can see on your screen, I hope you can see it, right? Everyone can see it. Um, this was for the New York Times, um, a travel assignment where I did only the photography uh, sometimes in my travel work, I do the writing as well as the photography. In this case, it was just the photography. So um, 
for the for the New York Times, uh, I don't need to introduce you to the New York Times, uh, one of uh, America's biggest uh, newspapers, also well known throughout the world uh, for its uh, quality writing, great photography. Um, and uh, one of its uh, major features is that it has a travel supplement, which is also very well regarded and at times has rivaled National Geographic um, for its content in, in, in terms of quality. Um, but unlike National Geographic, it's, it's much more skewed towards travel, um, personal travel and holidays and things like that, and not just like, you know, scientific uh, knowledge. Um, so, of course, the pressure was <laughs> quite heavy to you know, to be able to do something um, that would uh, keep up the, you know, the standards of, of the publication. Um, in, this, uh, in this case, the, the assignment was uh, for Candy and for Ella. And um, what was that? They had already sent a writer here to Sri Lanka who had uh, uh, written the article already. So my job was to then go back uh, retrace the steps of the writer and uh, illustrate his article. Uh, the writer was Lucas Peterson, um, a very well-known travel photographer, highly awarded, written for Lonely Planet, written for the LA Times. He's got his own YouTube channel. Um, so again, very high quality writing. So, um, so it was quite uh, stressful for me that I, you know, that I maintain the, the photography side of it uh, to, to that same quality. Um, the assignment itself, what uh, Lucas Peterson had done was he had traveled from Colombo to Candy by train, uh, spent a night in Candy, uh, seen, uh, uh, done, done some sightseeing in Candy, and then taken the train to Al. So he had basically written about his train journey and about these two places, about Candy and uh, Al. So my assignment from the, from the New York Times, given to me by the photo, photography editor of the New York Times, was to take photographs of the Temple of the Truth, the Peradeniya Gardens, and Alda, as well as the train journey itself. So uh, I had been told quite clearly that no more than half a dozen photos would be used. So um, there was quite a lot of, again, uh, emphasis on getting the right picture. You know, what photograph is going to pro properly represent the Maligawa, for instance, or the Peradeniya Gardens, or what is going to uh, distinctly show off Alla to an audience that has never been to Sri Lanka. And this was at the time, this was done in, I shot this in 2018, at the end of 2018, just before Christmas, uh, for a presentation, for publication in January 2019. And this was at the time when Sri Lanka had uh, been put, placed as one of the top destinations by Lonely Planet, um, one of the top five uh, islands in the world to visit. So the New York Times is very interested. And uh, so uh, getting the photographs right was very important for uh, you know, a travel feature like this. Um, so initially I had planned to just retrace Lucas Peterson's uh, journey, uh, take the train to Candy and then on to Allen. But by the time the assignment came on and everything was approved, there was no way to get a ticket because this was just before Christmas, height of 2018 uh, tourist season. There were no tickets from Candy to Alda. There were all, almost no, no uh, tickets from Palambo to Candy either. So I abandoned them. And um, uh, what I decided instead was to drive to Candy um, because I felt the, the journey to Candy by train itself wasn't that picturesque. Um, so my plan was that I would drive to Candy on day one in the afternoon, spend the night in Candy and shoot the Maligava on the second day morning. Uh, the Navafa Puja, uh, which is the second uh, Puja of the, of the day, uh, was what I would shoot. Then in the afternoon, I would go to Peradeniya Gardens, shoot the gardens. The next morning, early, I would head off to Alda and uh, spend the rest of that uh, third day on trains in that area, taking trains up, Bandarola back, you know, getting all the shots I needed on the trains and around there. And therefore, early morning, I was going to shoot the Nine Arch Bridge which uh, I discussed this with the editor and why it is not on the journey from Candy uh, to Alla, it was one of the things that Lucas Peterson had visited. So um, it, it was fine with him. So that was the plan. Um, basically uh, two and a half days of shooting, two and a half to three days of shooting to cover this. Um, the kit I was using, um, main uh, camera was a Canon D, uh, 5D Mark III 
with a 24-105 lens, which is like my workhorse lens. Um, very uh, versatile and I can use it for most things. Uh, backup was a 600D, just in case <laughs> the, the, the big camera failed, which has sometimes happened. I had cameras and lenses fail on me, so it I always have a backup. Um, additional lenses, I had a 50 millimeter Nifty 50 if I wanted to take some portraits or food photography or something like that if needed. And my uh, standby street uh, street photography lens, which is a pancake and then 24 millimeter 2.8. Um, I didn't, uh, I was not bothering with tripods. I, I, I had a tripod along, but I didn't see that as being one of the main features. Um, so uh, let's get on. So the first uh, one was the candy, uh, the, the Mali Gava. So what I thought was I would start off by doing some establishing shots of, of, uh, of the temple in its surroundings so that uh, people who would not be into Sri Lanka would get an idea of how, how the uh, temple sat in its surroundings and also a little bit of the architecture of the of the temple um, this particular shot um, i i didn't plan it out too much but uh, as you will see later on uh, this photo was quite significant i'll come back to this but overall when you're looking at it um, it was a great shot of showing off uh, how the maligao was situated with the udawata kale jungle behind um, in the morning sun here, so it gave a nice perspective and also the people and all of that. Um, then moving in closer, um, I, I wanted to show off some of the water features so again, because you must remember here that I didn't know which of these photographs I ever going to make it into the into the newspaper. So I was just trying to tell the story through as few photos as I could. Um, another thing here to remember when, when shooting often for magazines and for newspapers, is to try and give them vertical and horizontal options. So, like you know, if, if you're not sure what they what's going to work, uh, always take it in vertical as as well as horizontal, so that the, the editors have the flexibility of you know slotting this in to their layout how they how they can. Um, again, not a lot of editing is possible because this is uh, Indian photojournalism. It's going into a newspaper. So, unlike when you are doing something, say for yourself or for an award show. Or, or something like that. You can't drop in a sky. You can't, you know, do too much work uh, with it. You you've got to make the best of what what is is available there. So then I walked into the into the temple again, giving people just a, a feel of how it is because as you go in, everything narrows in and it's close. And my my photography is always trying to capture the atmosphere of what it is like. Try and get capture the sounds and the you know the the feelings of it even if you can't uh, get those on uh, in the camera itself. So my plan was to go up to the um, the Udamale, Udamahala, uh, where the exposition of the the tooth would happen, and um, I wanted to get in there early before the crowds got in too much because I wanted some shots of the people, um, what sort of people are there. So the place was filling in, and I got myself uh, into a nice uh, corner there with my back to the wall where I could then take pictures of people as they came in so that you could see the different sorts of people. And again, it's a bit tricky here because there's different kinds of lighting color here. There's like tungsten lights, there are fluorescent lights, um, there's a bit of sunlight falling in. Uh, so you've got, it's a bit tricky on the white balance. I usually just shoot in auto and sort out the white balance later uh, in post. Um, auto usually gives you all the flexibility when it comes to white balance. Um, so I, I, I got a few pictures like that of, of people, um, just to give a idea of what sort of people were here and what they were doing and what the feeling was. So like while there was all this bustle going on, there were people who were here, you know, taking a moment there um, to, uh, you know, to pray and uh, have a quiet time to themselves. So I had set myself up exactly opposite where the, the truth would be revealed. Um, I had no plan of being able to, you know, get a shot in there of the tooth uh, and all of that, but I just wanted to be in the, uh, where I was facing the center of what, uh, what was going to happen. So by then, of course, it was like now really jam-packed. Um, children were almost being trampled, old ladies were being <laughs> pushed into corners and like, you know, tourists, uh, locals, everyone was like jammed in there. So, um, uh, and you can see more people are coming in here. So I could just turn around. This, this railing was below me uh, and behind me. 
So you can see the clock there showing um, it's five minutes, 9.30 was when the puja was starting. The queue of people you can see here are the people who are queuing up for the, um, uh, the, you know, the period pack. And past them, people are rushing in to try and get upstairs before the puja starts. And uh, the countdown was on, so people are ready with their offerings. And uh, then, of course, it opened. Um, and of course, uh, you know, big noise and people shouting sadhu, sadhu, and people trying to get photos. So I had to actually take this photo by holding the camera above my head um, with, and focus with the LCD screen to try and get this shot. Um, slightly more close up, you can see I can't really, uh, couldn't get a really good shot of the, the truth itself uh, in there, but it was not important to me. I was more interested in getting the atmosphere of what it was like of the people and the crowd and the, the noise. Um, so then I managed to get myself to the front there and take a shot there of the people putting their flowers, flower offerings there and uh, worshipping in front of the truth just to get, show people you know, how crowded it really is um, when you're doing this. So it was a bit of a challenge because you always can't really compose the shot. People, It's like trying to take a perfect shot in the middle of a CTB bus at Russia. Um, from then there, I went straight on downstairs to where the ABC Puja had, it had already started. So like while we were upstairs, we could hear all the drumming and all that going on. So. Came, came down to get some good shots of that because I wanted pictures of the drummers um, and, and that side of it as well. So um, uh, uh, the drummers were in full action. So you can see them uh, there with uh, the guy on the left, that the, the Daula drum. I think there was um, a guy with the Yak Dere, uh, stuff like that. So this is surrounded by sound. Um, and I was at times slowing the shutter speed a little bit so that you could see some of the, the drumming movements of the hands here on the tabla. And uh, I also wanted to get like some close up shots, some portraits of the musicians. Uh, this guy was quite interesting. He had all these like sort of burn scars on his um, arms. You can see that they're on his uh, hands and upper arms. Um, again, it's not a great, it's not a super composed shot because uh, I had to crop it quite tight because there was another dancer here on the left who kept uh, coming into the frame. So I shot one in horizontal as well. I thought the vertical was better, but the horizontal I needed because then if the editor wanted to use it in some other way, he had that option. Uh, meanwhile, the people who had been queuing um, before were still in their queue uh, to get the, the pirit pan. Um, and uh, I guess now this is something we won't see so often now with all the COVID things, but this was just before that. So then to close it off, uh, I went back out, out of the temple and took some shots of the flower stalls outside um, just to give people a, the, 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 a look of the color and uh, so, some of that. Uh, close up shots of the flowers that were being uh, sold there. So that, that was the Mardi Gras. So then in the afternoon, what I did was I, I went off to, uh, to Peravania. And for me, Peravania was a bit of a challenge as well because uh, I, 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 it was a bit of a dilemma for me because this was being shot for an American audience primarily um, and in a country which has beautiful parks of their own. I was thinking, you know, what's the point of shooting another um, flower garden for them? They, they've got all these parks of their own. But then I thought, okay, anyway, it's not my choice. I've been told to shoot it, so I will shoot it. But I thought, okay, I'll try and show the tropical aspect of it. So rather than more than the you know beautifully landscaped lawns and flower beds and all, which, which is something that they would find quite uh, common, um, I instead went for, to try and show a more tropical side of it. Um, so the bamboo again, I thought, okay, New York talking the New York Times here. Yeah. New York's also famous for its graffiti and street art. So you can see that there's some street art and some graffiti of the bamboo trees as well. Um, and also with the, um, since the gardens are surrounded by water on, on many sides, it also gave a nice view of that tropicalness, um, almost jungle-like quality to the, to the gardens, which uh, is also there. Um, this is the, the other side of the park. Uh, taken from the from the bridge. Um, I went also uh, to the Great Circle. I thought that was also nice because it gave a nice central uh, local to the things. 
And uh, all this needed was, you know, a, a cricket match being played in the middle in, in white clothes would have been perfect. But um, uh, I was quite uh, pleased with this. Um, I quite like this shot. Um, the, the Muslim family that was walking across the lawn, the, the red of the clothing was like a perfect contrast to that deep green that was all around the park. Again, I want to, and plus, you know, you can see a little bit of red there in the background where the flower beds are. Um, again, I want to tell you how, you know, how you can't get the, it's very difficult to get the perfect composition, obviously, when you're shooting people like this. I mean, I would have liked this shot to be more like this, like I was looking down the avenue, but, uh, and while, while these ladies kept walking across the lawn, I kept moving sideways, trying to get them, uh, hoping they would come across, but then by the time I got here, <laughs> they turned off and gone off in another direction, so that was not possible. Um, and so then I, I also was shooting the trees throughout this whole thing. Um, Peradeniya Gardens is famous for these trees um, and, and the, you know, with their gnarled and twisted roots and all, I thought the, that would be a nice side of it as well, a uh, very tropical looking, um, uh, almost jungle-like quality to it. I, I wasn't uh, totally happy with these shots. I didn't feel I could do it justice in the time I had. Um, the background, there was a lot of sunlight in the background, which was slightly overexposed um, in order for me to get uh, the, enough uh, light on the, in, in the foreground. So I just felt it was not really a great, a great series of shots here, but I felt in the time given, it was the only thing that was really possible. Um, I much preferred the avenues with, you know, that geometric precision and the trees, uh, perpendicular trees and all that, I quite like that. And I felt and by that point, the sun was going down just right and the light was much better here. Again, stressing on the necessity to give some options of doing, you know, vertical as well as horizontal like this so that the editors have an option uh, in what they're doing. Um, so from there, it was then on to Alla the next day. So Alla, uh, okay, everyone's I think pretty familiar with Alla. So again, I, I was needing to, I wanted to do um, some establishing shots. So I took some shots of the, the Alla gap. Um, I, I stayed at a hotel, a small hotel there where I've stayed many times before. And um, um, this is from my balcony. So I knew that I, I'm gonna get these uh, shots I've shot so many times over the years in different kinds of lights so I knew I would get the shots I wanted so I, I quite like this view uh, down because there's almost no cultivation it shows a very you know wild side of uh, Sri Lanka these videos of jungle uh, going down there but then I also went on to uh, the other side and wanted to show a side of Alla where it's almost completely man-made um, this entire landscape here is created by man from the, you know, the tea plantations, uh, the carpets of tea, which were brought in uh, in the 18th and 19th century to the pine trees that were planted in the 1970s. Uh, there's nothing here that's natural, but it's still uh, a very beautiful landscape, just uh, almost completely man-made. Um, I also tried some night shots of Alla of the Gap. It's not a great shot. It's a bit grainy. Um, the ISO uh, was a bit high, um, but uh, I was. It was just an experimental shot. That streak of light you can see here in the middle is the train, the night mail going down to Colombo. Um, so the, um, uh, the this was of course one one I took on the last day. But the afternoon I got to Alla, I then spent um, on the trains basically and in and around the trains. Um, taking shots that would give people an idea of what it's like to travel in trains in, um, in that area. So I spent a lot of time at the stations uh, taking shots of the people and um, the engine driver here is leaning out to grab the, uh, yeah, I forget what that's called, the, the ring with the, the pass on it. Um, the tablet. And, yes, <laughs> tablet. tablet. Yeah. That's a tablet. Um, and the station masters in their, you know, uh, almost uh, old world, the colonial style uniforms, although now the uniforms are like polyester and, and other than starch cotton. Uh, and to sort of get, get, give people almost, let them be able to smell the, you know, the diesel uh, in, in, the, in the railway stations. 
um, and see what it's like in these you know little mountain railway stations with these trains going in and out um, with the guard waving it off here. Um, different kinds of some trains were mixed uh, passenger and cargo trains. And often I had to like sort of hitch a ride in the guard carriage because it was just impossible to get a window seat uh, or get anywhere near a window anymore uh, in that, you know, that around Ella. Uh, everyone's there hanging out the doors and windows trying to take pictures, as you can see. So I, again, I was trying to capture a little bit of that still what what sometimes quite often exciting and nostalgic in traveling by train in Sri Lanka that we all are reminded of our you know childhood days when we would go on holidays family holidays by train um, and of course the view out from the train again I I try to avoid some of the visual cliches that have been uh, as, uh, you know set up in the in, in recent years you know of the people hanging from the train from the doors and unless I avoid it, taking those shots there were people doing that but uh, I managed not to take those pictures um, and rather I want to show some of the, what it looked like from the train so these are like shots from the, the train itself um, over the course of that afternoon um, because you get little glimpses into uh, communities that you're passing by like this one which is the um, one of the the line houses uh, communities there where they're living surrounded by the tea that they uh, make a living from um, and of course it, as the evening fell it got mistier and uh, it was getting now harder to shoot moving from a, in a train it was getting harder but I got the last few shots like this as the mist came in and the light went um, and of course uh, the train going uh, itself going across the line arch bridge can see how crowded it has become now um, because of the it's become one of those instagrammable um, moments whenever you're in Sri Lanka you've got to take a shot at the line arch bridge or hanging from that coconut tree you know what on earth that <laughs> has the shots everybody wants to get um, so I, I particularly wanted to photograph the nine arch bridge without any people on it um, away from the, the crowd so the next morning I got there pretty early um around uh, just before sunrise in fact um this shot um, was actually taken it, it was much darker um i boosted a bit uh, it a bit in post here while i was waiting for the train this would have been about six o'clock but it's darker obviously of course in the mountain where the sun takes some time to come up over the hills but as you can see um, there's there's no people you can see the lights of Alla in the distance here through the trees, by which gives you an idea that it's it's a, it's a lot darker than it looks in this photo. Um, even then, there was still some <laughs> some life around. This uh, Tamil uh, walking across the bridge to set up his stall before the tourists and the local tourists and foreign tourists arrive. Um, so I, I quite like this shot also of the you know the slash of the uh, the railway track against the you know the, the jungle behind um and then i think about 6 15 the train arrived uh, this is the train going down actually this, this shot is um the train is traveling away from me in the shot but you can't really tell unless you look close up then if you go in close you can see that the the red lights so it looks as if the train is coming towards me so i took a series of these shots and this was actually one, one the one that made, was the main shot in the newspapers in the new york times when it went um, and uh, then I came down to the bridge because Lucas Peterson also had walked across, so I wanted a few shots on the bridge itself. And the lighting the, it was really nice, ambient light. It, it was a direct sunlight uh, sort of filtering through, but really nice light with uh, you know mist on the hills around, but still a lot of color, really bringing out the greens of the, the jungle. You know, if you look at the shot, like every color, every shade looks very rich. I mean, it's just perfect light. Um, I think it wasn't difficult to get a good shot in this uh, kind of a situation. Um, even here, this is looking from the bridge down the valley. You can see how rich the, the, the foliage looks in that light. Um, and then I got a quick 
uh, moment with the, the nightmare arriving, which was, this was the train that Lucas Peterson would have taken from Candy, I think. Um, so I charged down to the bridge there to get the shot. You can see how long the train is, both ends of the train. Uh, um, it's actually longer than the bridge itself. So again, slightly slow, slower than uh, normal shutter speed, so that there's a bit of motion blur there to get the movement of the train coming through the bridge, leaning over sort of as it goes around the bend. And uh, then uh, just a last shot of the, of the bridge from the other side. It would have been perfect again if, if a train was coming. But with all, with all these assignments, there's a very tight deadline. You don't have time to you know, do everything. You try to plan it all, but there isn't time to wait for the perfect shot. You've got to go with what you have. Um, so uh, that, that, that was the yes, assignment. And this was what finally what went in the papers. So out of all of that, I think I took about uh, 450 photographs, um, of which I submitted 15. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, it, it, you've got to be very brutal in, in your own selection of what you're going to hand in to the newspaper. And of those 15 that I handed, only three were used on that, uh, on that article. Um, so from 450 photographs, three were used. Um, including the the one uh, on the on the nine arch bridge of the train, the the Muslim ladies in the garden, and the family at the train window. Of course, the website then used a couple more shots because they have a little bit more space. So the the shot of the Maligava, which I spent you know I spent a lot of time on the Maligava. I was a bit disappointed that they, they didn't even use the Maligava in the, the newspapers, but they used it on the website. Um, also, uh, an interesting um, note to this is a year later, Random House um, called me, uh, emailed me, and they wanted to use the, the Malikawa photo in a book they were doing on man, called Man Made Wonders of the World, which is a coffee table book about great architecture around the world, some of the most iconic um, uh, monuments and castles and palaces. Um, so they were doing one of the ones they were featuring was the Temple of the Truth, and you can see their bottom left. Uh, they used that photograph as well. So it was it was cool that I was able to uh, also uh, use that photograph again, um, because with with publications you've got uh, they've got a year of exclusive use of it, and then after that you can use the image, you can sell it again. Um, so uh, that was uh, the, the assignment for the New York Times. Um, is there, are there any questions anyone has before I go on to the next one? Uh, and am I rushing? Um, uh, I don't know whether <laughs> I'm rushing. I just worried that I ran out of time. All right. So I'll take you on to the next one and then maybe we can catch up again for a few more questions after that. Um, okay. So the, the next one is for Serendip, was for Serendip, which uh, is the, um, uh, the in-flight magazine of Sri Lanka Airlines. Um, like um, the like uh, the New York Times, uh, it's again a, a publication that is very well known, particularly for its high quality photography. Um, it's a long standing magazine, uh, one of the the world's greatest in flight magazines. In fact, I've seen a lot of in flight magazines, and Serendip is one of the ones of the highest quality and. Uh, I know art directors who collected these magazines for years because of the quality of it. Um, I was lucky enough to, um, while I, this, this uh, assignment I'm going to take you through is from a few years ago, it's from 2016. Um, I was lucky that while I was at, uh, in advertising and doing photography as a hobby, um, I just sent in some of my work to um, uh, the editor of uh, Serendip and she started to give me work. And so it really was, this was my training really because of how to, you know, shoot on assignment and things like that. Um, what the, the difference between this assignment and the New York Times one was for Serendip, I was also writing. I was writing the article and photographing for it. So it, it, I had a lot more flexibility because um, I knew what I wanted to talk about in the story. So photographing, um, uh, the the uh, the the scene I was doing um, was based on my own writing, so um, it was not difficult. It, it, it was easier in some ways. Um, 
very often though i would go and take uh, it, it was all always an uh, an experiential thing that uh, serena would tell me okay can you go and do a piece on three, how to spend a weekend in abradpur so i would go there i would uh, walk around take my photos and then come back to colombo and write the story as well so the photography always came first and the writing came after but in my head they both went together um so it was a different experience uh, uh, from uh, doing what i did for the new york times which was just doing the photography for something somebody else had written um in in this case basically the the assignment and and serendi always gave me like one line briefs very uh, short briefs uh, very brief briefs so in this case it was go to pasigoda get on a boat and take uh, tell us what happened so uh, basically there there was this there's this company that was doing this uh, yachting uh, excursions out of pasigoda at the time and uh, so i had to drive from colombo to pasigoda um get on this um, uh, yacht which is a sailing yacht and they would take if you can see the map there they would take me north out of pasigoda and up the coast to uh, chalatibu island which is off the coast of wakarai and uh, we would get there by evening and uh, drop anchor there spend the night there of uh, chalatibu island and the next morning they take us to various beaches snorkeling all that sort of thing and then sail sail back to um, uh, pasigoda so it was going to be 24 hours on on this sailing yacht um my uh, so that was the brief um uh, nothing more than that um the kit i was using this was again this was before so uh, what i was using at that time was uh, my old 600d aps c sensor uh camera with a 18 to 200 uh, variable aperture zoom um backup uh, also not backup but lenses i took along was the again the nifty 50 and the 24 mm uh, 2.8 uh one important thing here uh, that i must talk about when particularly when you are shooting uh, water and the sea is a polarizing filter um because as you, as you as i show you the photos you'll get an idea of that how vital that polarizer is in cutting out glare and reflected uh, sunlight of the water and really giving some superb contrast like you know giving the sea and the sky those deep blues and greens which uh, you can't really get if if the sun is reflecting too much of it um and i i love this polarizer and for years i never to almost never took it off my lens um i don't use uv filters on my lenses at all i know a lot of people use it as a protection i i don't uh, i don't like having uv filters on it i i have hoods on all my lenses even my <laughs> that pancake lens has a has a hood on it um so but the the uv filter the, the polarizer was the one filter that stayed on that lens all the time unless i was shooting indoors um i didn't bother here with the tripod because uh, when you're on a boat uh, and you're shooting stuff a tripod is of no use because uh, the entire boat is rocking so tripod everything is uh, rocking um you do better actually hand holding the camera because uh, your body then is a, like almost a bit of a shock absorber um uh, and you see with some of the low light stuff as well that uh, having a tripod would have been of no use so i just left the tripod at home um okay so carrying on so got drove to pasigoda um and straight off here you can see what the polarizer does this is uh, the kind of high contrast uh, you get from the polarizer and the way it cuts out the reflections on the water and gives that really beautiful turquoise uh, color to to the the water uh, so i got to pasigoda which is quite crowded all the locals it was uh, it was in the middle of the week i think so there were no tourists as such is all locals from the area um and this was the the boat i was going to uh, spend um uh, 24 hours on this is called jade uh it's 16 and a half meters long eight and a half meters wide mast is about 20 meters high and uh, it's about it weighs about it displays about 12 tons uh crew of three it can carry eight passengers in those um, uh, it's a catamaran so the the two it's twin hull uh two cabins in each of the hulls so it can carry eight passengers those four cabins 
uh, speed of about six knots under sail, but it also has a couple of diesel engines, um, which take it a bit faster uh, when necessary. It's a fully seagoing yacht. It, it was sailed to uh, Sri Lanka from Italy, where it was constructed, so it came across the Indian Ocean. Um, and it can be out at sea for as long as you have food on it. Um, then uh, the boat took us out. So again, here you can see the, what, what the polarizer does for you. Um, that you know, you, you, you might, many of you might have seen that almost floating look that you get when, when you, people photograph boats on calm water. Here the water isn't that calm, there are waves. So, but, but if it was calm, that um, you would see the shadow of the boat on the sand below and you would get that effect of the boat almost floating uh, above the water. It just cuts out almost all reflections. And uh, this is, uh, as we close in on the boat, that's how you get a board, pretty simple. And uh, so this was a big, I got, got on board uh, around lunchtime and we got ready to take off. So that's uh, uh, the captain there uh, as the sails are being raised to go off. Uh, pulling up the sail. The sail, the sail, this particular sail is built in Sri Lanka. This, it's all sold in Sri Lanka, though the boat is from Italy. Uh, for some reason, I think the sail was damaged when they arrived here and they got a new sail made here in Sri Lanka. Um, again, you can see what the polarizer does to the sky here. Um, deep blues that you know, you would not get if you didn't have a polarizer on. So that uh, really stark shot. So I basically, as we were getting ready to go, I wanted to get these shots of the sails being lifted and uh, filling up with air as the wind caught it. And then we set off. So basically everyone who was a passenger settled down now for the journey with a whatever beverage you wanted at hand. Um, so I, my plan then was I, while, while we were going, I would uh, I decided I would go around the boat and take some you know detailed shots of what it felt like to be on this boat um, in this perfect weather. The sea wasn't very rough at all. And it being a catamaran, it's a lot more stable than a single hull boat. So the stairs you're seeing here lead up to the upper deck um, where the captain steers the boat from up here. Um, that's the captain, he is a Frenchman, and um, uh, he's been working for this company here in Sri Lanka. He's gone now, he's I think in Portugal or something. And uh, everything is fairly high tech, GPS uh, tracking uh, devices there, which uh, show them their, uh, their position in real time, the depth of the sea around and all of that. So you can see our journey being recorded there on the screen. And so while we were doing that, um, the the crewman and uh, that was our guide. Uh, he, he's also he's also French, um, putting out the fishing rods to catch us something for dinner. And uh, that's the the ship's cook getting the veggies ready. You can see it's a fairly small boat, so like the, the kitchen area is quite small. So he's getting the vegetables ready while they were catching the fish, and. Um, I just spent some time taking some detailed shots of, uh, of the boat. Um, this is the, the winch that raises the sail. It's, it's off a racing, uh, the same winch that's used on a racing boat. Um, high, high speed so they can quickly raise the sails or remove, or remove them very quickly. Uh, you can see a detail here of the beautiful you know, stitching that's been done. This is done, in, as I said, in Sri Lanka uh, to a pattern that was given to them. This is the, the bow spit on, on the yacht heading out and see again the color of the water. Uh, the, as I said, the weather was great, but we, we could see uh, rain, rain in the distance in patches. You can see that strip of cloud there and below that the rain, but nothing really came near us at all. So uh, the sun had been going down and by afternoon now, uh, as the sun was going down on, on the land side, we were approaching Chalatibu Island. Um, I mean, it's incredibly beautiful. I mean, whichever direction you look. look. Um, one thing though I want to mention here is, if you, this is not a great shot, I just want to show you guys this. If you look at the beach, if you can make out those white dots along the beach there, it's all plastic. 
uh, we kept we, we, we visited beaches where there was absolutely no human population that can't these beaches that can't be reached by by land by road only way in, is by boat and they're all covered with plastic because there's so much plastic in the water already and unlike in the on the west coast and in the south where you know the hotels clean up the beaches around them there's nowhere no one there to clean the beaches so everywhere we went plastic was part of what we were seeing um so anyway we we dropped anchor off chalatibu island and I had this plan. I, my plan was the next morning I wanted to take the rubber boat out and get some shots of the boat and the sunrise. Uh, so obviously, the only way is to get it is from the water. So I needed to get the boat out and take a shot away from the boat. So I decided I would do a, a test run uh, in the evening. So just to see how things work. So I got the rubber boat out and did some circuits around uh, uh, Jade. And I was I was quite happy with these uh, shots at sunset and just after sunset um, of Jade at anchor. Again, like I said in the earlier assignment, uh, try and get horizontal and vertical shots as much as you can. Um, I actually thought this would maybe make the cover photo, um, but it did. They used something else uh, for the cover, but um, I was quite happy with this vertical shot. So sometimes uh, even uh, landscape photography can be vertical. Um, depending on what you're shooting. Uh, so after dinner, it was to bed. That that was my cabin. Um, quite quite large actually, like, uh, surprisingly large. Uh, there was a there's a hatch directly above the the uh, bed, so you get ventilation. And uh, there's these uh, windows uh, portholes on the side, which you have to be careful because I had it open and uh, got my pillow splashed with some <laughs> water uh, from a wave in the night. But it was quite nice. Um, each room had its own bathroom attached, which is a bit like a you know a, a bathroom on an aircraft. Uh, but it had its own shower as well, which you don't get on a plane, obviously. So I was up the next morning at dawn um, to take some shots before the just as the sun was rising. So the, this is the moon on the land side setting. Um, so this was taken with the twenty-four millimeter two point eight lens. Um, I, I used it because of the wide aperture in, in this low light. So again, like I said, a tripod would have been useless here because uh, the the boat would have been rocking and everything would have been everything that wasn't on the boat would have been blurred. So I just took this handheld. Um, this is from the upper deck, and so the sun started to arrive. So that's Chalabevo Island there in the distance, and the sun just coming up over the horizon. So then I got the uh, one of the the sailor to get the boat out. So that uh, I could get the shots I wanted off of Jade itself. So that's looking uh, west towards the land, the moon setting on that side, and the sun rising on this side. So uh, it was a bit tricky because it's not like you're walking around the boat. You hear it's uh, you're in another boat, photographing a boat on a slightly rocking sea, and I'm not also, I'm not you know in control of the boat. Someone else is. So I had to keep telling him, now you know, turn around a bit, move me two feet back. Take me forward a bit, so I kept. Uh, we kept uh, shuffling around while I kept taking shots, trying to um, get the shot I wanted. You know, so uh, getting in closer, going back, and so I had the zoom lens, so that also helped. I was able to track in and uh, frame the shots differently. Until uh, this was the shot, really, uh, I was hoping to get with the island and the boat uh, and the sun uh, in the background. And that's the one that eventually went on the cover of the magazine. So you can see, again, though it was a landscape format shot, um, it was used in vertical format in the magazine. Uh, the sun itself didn't make it onto the cover, <laughs> just out of frame there. But uh, that was the shot that was used finally on Senate Dib's cover. Um, so then breakfast. Um, again, so I, I needed to get the include that as part of the experience for this because it's a travel magazine and we're trying to tell people what this experience is going to be like. So the, it, it was a fairly simple breakfast, but like the dinner before, because the, the both the captain and the guide were French, uh, there's a you know French flair to the, to the food as well. Um, and uh, so also how I wanted to photograph it, it was I wanted to keep it very light and kind of high key, make sure like, there was the sea in the background in, in 
even in the food shops. Um, I also, of course, like to take food very close up um, and uh, uh, overhead so that you see food, um, how you would actually see it just before you put it in your mouth, because that's uh, I feel that's how tasty it looks. So like two ways of taking food, you know, you can get it very close and show it very rich or show it more in a sort of environmental kind of shot where you get an idea of what it's like around. Um, so after breakfast, um, I instead of showering, I went for a swim. And uh, then we uh, headed off to Chalatibu Island. So we left by boat from the rubber boat, which is the, this is the rubber boat I photographed uh, Jade from. And over to Chalatibu Island. And again, you can see how pristine it is as long as you don't look too closely at the plastic in the background. But uh, blue waters, again, the, the polarizing filter uh, does so much here to really make uh, uh, the, the contrast and the color that uh, you want. Um, this is the, the show of Chalatibu Island. And to the, on the right side, you can see that's all heaps of coral. And uh, that's all coral that has either been damaged in the tsunami or been blasted by fishermen who were blowing holes in the reef to get their boats out. So a lot of that coral is, is dead coral, obviously. And uh, mixed into that is a lot of plastic bottles and yogurt cups and uh, uh, a lot of pollution. Uh, walking along the beach is that because of the, the coral is a bit difficult. You need to wear something on your feet. It's not like walking on sand. Um, but uh, the water itself was brilliant, beautiful, clear, uh, super for snorkeling, um, and we, we did a lot of that. I should have, I think, uh, in hindsight, taken a, a GoPro or something like that, where I could have taken some shots underwater, um, but I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't plan for that. But we did a lot of snorkeling. Um, as we uh, uh, were spending time here, uh, it was um, while it was uh, fairly deserted, I mean, it was not that we were completely alone. There were fishermen uh, in the area as well. This is an old man coming in uh, after fishing and dawn, just coming in with the sun and having a close look at us there. And there are other fishing boats uh, all around from time to time. Um, so by this time, um, it was time for us to then head back. So the, the sails were raised again. That's uh, the captain having an inspection at it. And we headed back south to uh, Clark Point and this rock called Elephant Rock, where again, uh, the plan was to uh, do some paddle boarding. Uh, you can see how calm the water is again. I mean, you, you could just stand on this paddle board and uh, uh, take, uh, travel along with that plus snorkeling. Uh, all around there, great, uh, great area for snorkeling, very calm, beautiful. Um, and lunch, <laughs> again. So again, uh, high key photography for the lunch because I wanted to get, get that same atmosphere of what it felt like to be on a boat in the sunshine uh, in this great weather. Again, simple food, but with a little bit of flair to it. And uh, by then, of course, we're back at, uh, 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 so I, I just made a quick uh, trip to the other boat. They have another boat, which is like a day trip boat, which I got onto so that I could take a picture of Jade from a distance. Um, but there we were. So back back at Pasikoda, still crowded, lots of people still swimming around. And uh, a last shot as I was departing of um, uh, Jade in the distance as we came ashore. Um, so the magazine, uh, you already saw the cover photograph um, uh, of uh, the sunrise uh, went on the photograph, uh, went on the cover and uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, about maybe seven or eight pictures altogether in the, in the magazine and uh, the same uh, in the, on their website as well. Um, what else can I say? I mean, it was a great experience and um, I think uh, the overall effect that I was able to get with the, with the photographs and the writing, I think captured it uh, pretty decently. So um, that's my presentation. Thanks.
guys for listening so patiently uh, while I talk <laughs> talk about my photos. Um, if you guys want to see more of my work, um, I'm on social media. Just search for David Blacker or Son of the Morning Light, which is um, the name I go on in social media. It's on uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Uh, I'm there. So uh, that's it from me. <laughs>